Welcome, Cornerstone. Uh, we're glad that you joined us again this morning under these unique uh, circumstances. Uh, you know, unique circumstances bring out unique opportunities uh, for us to serve one another and for us to minister. And every church I know is scrambling, trying to figure out how to minister to their uh, congregation while their people are uh, scattered all around. So uh, we hope you find these uh, videos uh, useful. And one good thing about them, you can tell your friends about them because uh, they're easy to direct them to, uh, to our YouTube channel. Uh, but we are glad you're here this morning. Uh, just a couple of brief uh, announcements. Uh, thanks for those of you who continue to mail in your offerings. Uh, believe it or not, churches still have expenses, even though we can't gather every week. And uh, for those of you who have uh, continued to support the church financially, uh, thank you. And a reminder, you can continue to do that by mailing uh, offerings to uh, our church uh, mailbox, Box 246, Hampstead. And also, uh, more importantly, if you have any needs or any concerns, be sure to contact your elder uh, and let them know how you're doing. And hopefully uh, they're staying in touch with you and you can keep up and we can minister to one another even though uh, we're separated. We are going to uh, sing a song this morning. And uh, if you're at home, uh, it's a familiar hymn. You can sing along uh, with Young as he comes, but he's gonna come and begin our uh, worship time together. Young? Good morning. Our uh, call to worship this morning is from Psalm 18. And it's a Psalm of David. It begins, uh, in verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. And that is our corporate prayer, too. Um, we call on the name of the Lord, and he is worthy to be praised. Uh, we're going to sing Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, the great Fanny Crosby hymn. If you know it, sing along at home, lift up your voices. Uh, if not, just uh, let it minister to you this morning. Jesus
Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask his blessing on us. Lord, we recognize your goodness, your power, and your wisdom. You alone are God, and you alone are worthy of all praise and adoration. For you have created this world and all that is in it. You gave us life, and you continue to sustain us each and every day by the word of your Spirit. We confess that we have not always honored you as the true God. We confess our weakness in looking to other things to provide security and joy. We ask you to forgive us and teach us what it is like to find our life in you alone. Be with our world today as it is filled with anxiety and fear over unseen plagues, over unstable economies, over uncertain futures. May the people of this world know that you are God, and may many of them know your salvation in Christ. Be with your people today, for many of us are unsure how to live in times like this. Give us new opportunities to serve and love others. Give us security in knowing our God is in control, and give us the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. We continue to pray for those who serve on the front lines of fighting uh, this plague that we are involved in. We pray that you would give our leaders and medical personnel and military people wisdom and protection and give them hearts of compassion even for those they serve. Finally, we would pray for those of us who are gathered this hour, wherever we may be, to hear your word. We pray for your spirit to guide and instruct us in the truth and may you speak to us now as you promised through your word that we would see Christ and his great salvation. In his name we pray, amen. We are gonna continue in our study of John and we are up to John chapter 19, the crucifixion. A number of weeks ago when I put the schedule together, I basically started at Easter and went backwards and figured out how we could get to uh, the Easter message, which is chapter 20. Uh, by Easter Sunday. So we are going to take a rather large section here of uh, John chapter 19, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. And I'm going to begin reading with verses 17, and I will read down through verse 30 from God's word. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they gave a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the crucifixion of Jesus. And every one of them records 
little bit different detail than the other. They're all trying to make their own points. They're trying to communicate a message about what the crucifixion of Jesus was like and, and what it shows us, what it points us to. I'm going to take our text this morning and try to say three things that John was trying to communicate to us about the crucifixion and see if these don't apply to our hearts and our lives today. And the first thing I think John was trying to say was simply this, that the cross is God's plan for his son. Um, in particular, verses 18 to 24 talk about two things that are happening uh, in, that if you looked at from the outside perspective, you might say, well, that's just politics going on or that's just soldiers doing what soldiers do. But there, these two things are Pilate is having this uh, debate with the uh, religious leaders over what to put on top of the cross, what to, what to make the charge of, uh, what to accuse Jesus of. Uh, typically, when a person was hung on a cross, the charge was placed above their head. So everybody who walked by would know what the crime was that this person has committed. And Pilate is debating this with the, uh, with the religious leaders of the day. Pilate says, this is king of the Jews. That's what he has written on the placard. And the religious leaders are insulted by this because they don't want their king to be crucified. And they don't want anybody to think that Jesus really was their king. But Pilate is pretty insistent. He lost a couple of these other political arguments that he's been having along the way regarding Jesus and the crucifixion. So when they come to him and want the wording changed, Pilate says, no, I'm not going to change it. I've written what I've written. And he writes it in three languages. At least the ESV mentions these three. There were at least three. Aramaic, which was the common language of Palestine. Everybody around the, there spoke this. This was the common language of the people. Latin, which was the language of the army. And Greek, which was the universal language of the Roman Empire. So virtually everybody who walked by the cross at that particular moment could look up to the top of the cross and they could see this is Jesus, King of the Jews. What looks like political infighting, Pilate fighting against the religious leaders, is really the hand of God declaring a truth. And John doesn't want us to miss it that Jesus really was crucified because he was the king of the Jews. Remember what John said in the very beginning of his book, he came unto his own and his own received him not. This is what people do to their king. And in fact, this is what people have been doing to the king of the universe ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden. They have been rejecting him. They have been crucifying him. And John doesn't want us to miss the irony this is Jesus. He is the king and he's being crucified. But there's another thing that's going on here too. And that is the description of the, the soldiers selling Jesus's clothing. In verses 23 to 24, they crucified Jesus, the soldiers that were in charge of the crucifixion. And so they take his garments and they divide them into four parts. Now the four parts are probably his, uh, his belt. He would have had sandals. That would have been another part. There would probably have been a head covering and, and his robe, of course. So there would have been four parts. The soldiers would have, there were most likely four soldiers. They would have divvied these four parts up. But there was one other piece left, and it's the piece that they referred to as the tunic. The tunic was the thing that was worn underneath the robe. And evidently, it was a special piece of cloth because it was woven seamlessly and so instead of destroying it and tearing it up into four parts, the soldiers decide to cast lots for it. And John looks at this event and at first glance, it looks like, well, it's just soldiers doing what soldiers do. You know, soldiers are, are reaping the spoils of war. And this was common law. Soldiers could do this to the clothing of crucified uh, criminals. Uh, they could take them and divide them up to, amongst themselves just as they could take the possessions of any conqueror, the, any person that they conquer. And yet John's telling us there's something more going on here. What's actually going is they're fulfilling an Old Testament scripture which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. And John quotes Psalm 22 verse 18. 
And if you know anything about Psalm 22, Psalm 22 describes in rather poignant detail a great deal of the suffering and a great deal of the pain that Jesus went through when he hung on a cross. And so John is telling us that this isn't just soldiers gambling over a man's clothes while he dies naked on a cross. What's actually happening is God's plan is being fulfilled like the psalmist a thousand years earlier predicted it would be. And this isn't just politicians arguing over what wording to put on a placard over Jesus's head. This is actually God communicating to the world in all the languages of the world, in the universal language of the world, that Jesus is king. And so the first thing you see is that this is really God's plan for Jesus to be on the cross. And it has been God's plan for a long time. And God is not surprised by it. And in fact, God is orchestrating what looks to us like common, ordinary, everyday events. He is orchestrating them to accomplish his good purpose. You know, I see politicians arguing all the time as in terms of what we should do or what direction we should take. You see soldiers or you see young men or you see people out on the streets acting a certain way and you say, well, maybe they're just acting that way because that's who they are and politicians, that's what they do. But do you realize behind everything, there is the sovereign hand of God. And this should actually give us comfort, especially in a time of crisis, to know that behind every action of every person, of every politician, of every official, of every medical professional, there is ultimately the hand of God directing the plan and the flow of history in a way and in a direction that will ultimately give him glory. So the first thing we see is that the cross is God's plan. But the second thing I think John wants us to see is the cross is also a place of Jesus's compassion. There's this interesting story that John alone tells in verses 25 to 27 of Jesus' interaction with his mother. Um, there were not a few women who had actually came to the crucifixion. Interestingly enough, you don't see a lot of the men at the crucifixion. You don't see a lot of the male disciples at the crucifixion. And there's actually a strategic reason for that. Um, the, if, if all of the disciples would have shown up to the crucifixion, uh, the Roman soldiers would probably have gotten a bit suspicious and would not have allowed them there for fear that they would either try to come and rescue Jesus or do something else. Remember an earlier confrontation Peter had with one of the, uh, with the soldiers trying to arrest Jesus, he cut off his ear. So the soldiers are gonna be a little suspicious of the uh, disciples, so they don't show up, that and the fact that they're afraid. But the women are a little less threatening. And so the New Testament writers tell us that there were a number of women who showed up. And John seems to list at least four of them, including his mother. And the cross was not something, you know, you, you watch the movies sometimes and you see the cross like it's this big, huge, gigantic, high thing where Jesus is way, way up on the, on far, far away. But actually the cross was only no more than 10 feet high. This cross behind me is about 10 feet high. And Jesus was only a few feet off the ground, if that. And anyone within relatively close distance could not only hear him, but could interact with them. And so Jesus is dying in agony. But in the midst of his dying in agony, he begins, he notices his mother. And he notices, John calls him the disciple that Jesus loved. And for most scholars, the disciple Jesus loved is actually John. That's John putting himself in the story because John evidently was the only male disciple that was there at the cross. And he's there probably because John's mother is there. There's actually some speculation that John's mother is actually Mary's sister, meaning John and Jesus are cousins. Um, so John is there. He's there probably with his mother. He's there with Jesus's mother. And when Jesus sees both of them, he says to Mary, behold your son. And he says to John, behold your mother. Now, what is he doing? Well, he's actually fulfilling the obligation of the elder son in a Jewish family. When a, when a father had died, as seems to be the case with Jesus's father, most surely Joseph had 
died, Jesus became the head of the household. He was the elder son. And so it's his responsibility to care for his mother and for the rest of the younger members of the family. And here he is fulfilling his family obligation by caring for his mother in the midst of the agony of the cross. Now, there's two things I notice about this. Number one is, when I'm in agony, when I'm in physical pain, the last thing I care about is anybody else. And yet, here's Jesus, whose body has been tortured, who is in most excruciating pain, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and what is he doing? He's caring for his mother. And here's his mother who came to the cross probably to give comfort and aid as best she could to her son. And instead of her giving comfort and aid to Jesus, Jesus is giving comfort and aid to her. And it strikes me that that's a picture of the cross for all of us. We come to the cross and we see Jesus crucified and we just kind of see it in our minds and we know it's ugly and we know it's painful and we say, oh, if there's only something we could do. And yet when we come to the cross, it isn't we who can do anything, but it's Jesus who gives comfort to us. It's Jesus who supports us, who encourages us, who gives us his life, who gives us his righteousness so we can be forgiven. The cross is the expression of Jesus's compassion for sinners like us. And so the cross, and here's this little story with Jesus and his mother, which pictures that. And I think John doesn't want to miss us. That the cross is, yes, it's a place of great cruelty and it is a place of punishment and it is a place of wrath, but it is also a place where the compassion of a loving Christ can be displayed. The cross, you see, was God's plan from the beginning, from the beginning of time for his son to atone for the sins of the world. And Pilate, unbeknownst to him, is playing into the hand of God. And the soldiers, unbeknownst to them, are playing into the plan of God. But the cross is also the place where God's love is most profound. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. And so here's Jesus interacting with his mother, reminding us that the cross is a place of great compassion as well. But there's a third message here. And the third message is this, that the cross represents the completion of Jesus' work. And this is what happens in the last several verses that I read. In verse 28, Jesus knowing, that all was, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Now, there's an, an Old Testament text. There's some question as to where this scripture is being, uh, is being taken from. There's some uncertainty to it. But um, Jesus understands that his dying on the cross is part of scriptural fulfillment. So he cries out, it's saying, I thirst. And then he receives the drink that they give him. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put the jar on sour wine on a hyssop branch. They hold it up to his mouth and he takes a drink. Now, this, uh, Jesus is high dehydrated as a result of the torture that his body's been through. So his crying out in thirst would be a natural, that would be a natural condition of the body under the strain that it has gone through. Why does he say, I thirst? And then why does he receive the drink? By the way, don't confuse this. Mark talks about another instance where Jesus refuses wine mixed with myrrh. Uh, Wine mixed with myrrh was typically um, a sedative that was given to condemned criminals so that the pain would be eased so much as they died. This is not that. This is actually a vinegar type substance that was given to prisoners so that it really did help you to regain some saliva. It allowed you to uh, even regain some strength, as it were. But here's what also it allowed Jesus to do. It allowed him to speak. 
And there is one more thing that he wants to say. So he asks for a drink. They give him the drink. It gives him enough energy to say these words. It is finished. And then he bows his head and dies. John wants the words of Jesus to be heard. It is finished. Now, this is more than simply Jesus saying, well, time's up. I've been here long enough. Now I think I'll die. That's, there's more to it than that. In fact, the word indicates completeness or fulfillment or carrying out a plan or even paying out. And the word was used in a broad context in, uh, in Roman culture at the time. In a religious context, the, you would say... Um, you have fulfilled your obligation. You know, you had a duty to your God and you, you did what your God asked you to. So you have fulfilled your obligations. You've completed your duty. In an economic context, the word was sometimes used to convey the idea that a debt had been paid. So you, had a, you, had a, you took out a loan or you needed to get some money together to pay for a transaction. When the transaction was, 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 was exchanged, when the proper monies were being paid to the person you owed to, you could say it is now finished. The debt has been paid. It is complete. It is over. So what did Jesus finish when he died on the cross? Well, very simply, he finished the plan that God had ordained from the beginning of the ages to provide salvation for sinners. It was a plan that was promised back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And God promised that the seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent. One day I'm going to send you a man, and that man will defeat Satan. And that promise from Genesis 3, verse 15, was a promise that was held out throughout all of the Old Testament. Throughout thousands of years of Old Testament history, people are waiting. When is God going to keep his promise? When is this covenant going to be fulfilled? When is this serpent going to be crushed? When is death going to be crushed? When is sin going to be atoned for? When are all these things going to happen? And Jesus dying on the cross says, now. It happens now. It is finished now. It is completed now. Sins are atoned for. Forgiveness is given. A way for men and women to see God is now open. Victory over Satan and evil accomplished now. Eternal life is secured now. Peace with God is possible now. It is finished. Everything the Old Testament saints waited for has now come to fruition on the cross when Jesus dies. And by the way, Everything that was finished on the cross remains finished after the cross. You realize that, don't you? Jesus no longer dies again. Jesus no longer has to sacrifice his blood again. He sacrificed once for all, for all time, for all eternity. And everything the Old Testament saints waited for became complete in Jesus' death. On the cross. Now, it wasn't the end of Jesus uh, of, of God's work in the sense that, yes, the resurrection is going to happen after the cross, and yes, Jesus will ascend to the right hand of God the Father. Yes, he will and continues to rule from that place of authority. He rules from the right hand of God the Father. Yes, he's coming back. He will establish his kingdom on earth. But everything he came to earth to do in his first coming, all the salvation he promised is secured in this one event. It's secured in the death of Jesus Christ. It's almost like the, res the death of Jesus, rather, is not the end of a line. The death of Jesus is more like the center of the circle. You know, it's like the hub with every which, in which everything else revolves around. All of God's other plan, all of God's other work that he's, that he, that he's going to, all the redemption of all creation, its center is the, is the crucifixion. And the crucifixion didn't happen until it happened. And when it happened in history, in real time, in real space, and Jesus really dies... Then he can finally cry out, it is finished. The debt has been paid. The obligation has been fulfilled. No more will anyone need to do anything like this. 
and finally he gives up his spirit. And it says it just that way, too. It doesn't say he died. It doesn't say, you know, as a result of the loss of blood, as a result of all of this, Jesus, Jesus finally passed away. It says he gave up his spirit. Now, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the spirit that gives life. It's talking about his spirit inside of him. In other words, Jesus' death was on his terms. Jesus died when he wanted to die. In John 10, 18, he said this, he said, no one takes it from me. He's talking about his life. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Jesus dies on his own terms. The, one of the other gospel writers tells us that Pilate himself is surprised at how quickly Jesus dies. Sometimes it will take people days to die on the cross. Yet Jesus dies relatively quickly in comparison. Why? Because he's the one who gave up his spirit. And why does he give up his spirit? Because the debt had been paid. Because all had been accomplished. Because everything he came to this earth to do has now been done and now been accomplished. So we see that the cross was God's plan. We see that the cross was also the place of God's greatest compassion. It is where he shows his love for sinners. And the cross was the completion of Jesus' work on earth. We can be encouraged by this, even in the age in which we live, to know that there is a God who has a plan for our lives. There is a God who is continuing to show his love for people. And by the way, you know, fundamentally, the way he shows his love for others is through us. One of the ways that we can demonstrate the love of Christ on the cross is by us loving other people, loving those in need. And we have opportunity to do that, even in this situation in which we face. And we can rest in the fact that no matter what happens in the future, the cross has completed God's work and our sins are atoned for. And all of those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be with him throughout all of eternity. And he will bear the scars in his hands and in his side. And they will not be scars that we will be unashamed to look at, but they will be scars of God's great love, of his covenantal love for us. And they will be with him throughout all of eternity to remind us that the price has been paid. The battle has been won. Victory has been secure. And we can rest in our Savior even now. Let's pray. Lord, may you take this your word and encourage us in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. May the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.